nation, come to my nation, I put the next chance to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. This is specifically, she's very on point. Like she just gives you clear, precise, practical, usable information. So we're gonna welcome Charmaine Murray. It's Charmaine Hiket from Hiket Najeti. She's a mother of two. She's a birth doula, trained in yoga and pregnancy yoga. She's a yoga and pregnancy yoga teacher, a womb health practitioner, wellness advocate for doTERRA essential oils. She's trained in the safe use of essential oils in pregnancy. And we actually, I actually interviewed her for my podcast. So if you go to naturallyyoucoach.com forward slash podcast, there's actually an interview with me and her where she speaks specifically about how to use aromatherapy oils in pregnancy. She teaches two pregnancy yoga classes a week. She runs an online womb and fertility cleanse. And that's not just for fertility, but it's also for fibroids, PCOS, and endometriosis. Her life passion is to share her knowledge and empower women to achieve better birth circumstances and outcomes. Because as we know, black women are unfortunately more likely to pass on during childbirth than our other culture counterparts and to also empower um, couples to support each other through the journey. So if we can please have a warm round of applause to welcome Charmaine to the stage. Wow, amazing. Can you hear me? <laughs> uh, Okay, so welcome everyone, thank you. Um, amazing to be here with you today and uh, I'm, I'm sure you've enjoyed some amazing speakers already and got a lot of value from your day so far. Um, so I hope to um, just share a bit more knowledge with you today. So as Leah mentioned, um, I am a doula, I'm a pregnancy yoga teacher and um, I do a lot of room healing and health as well. So I'm going to start by touching on some of the room healing and health. Can I get to okay? Yes, that's better. Can we hear you now? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll start again. <laughs> right, I'm glad you can hear me. Um, so we're gonna get into this presentation now. Um, I'm a mother of two myself. Um, my daughter's four. My son is six. Um, and I'm very passionate about womb healing and um, preparing women and partners for birth. Um, it's been a big journey for me, so through my, I guess my journey started with my mum who suffered from uh, fibroids, um, my grandmother suffered from fibroids, my aunt suffered from fibroids, and I could see that this was an issue that could happen to me, so that's what made me more interested. I was very keen to find information that would be um, more natural and more healthy, and that's what started my kind of herbal medicine training and study in this area. So I'm dealing with um, the female reproductive um, cycles. The wound cleanses I run online, um, and I did it because I had people that were not always local to me. So I wanted to make sure that I could get this information kind of far and wide. And um, it's about knowing your cycles and knowing your bodies. And for me, I think this needs to start from puberty. I think there needs to be a lot more education from you know, our, our daughters are having their cycles and our sons even learning more about this information, right through to menopause. So knowing your cycles, knowing your body, learning your body. When you get to learn your body in your own natural cycles, it really helps you to feel a lot more empowered about how to support yourself. So even though the cleanses can be general, I'm very specific at dealing with everybody's specific needs because everybody has individual needs at the same time. So women can cycle at different times. You might be cycling 28 days, 35 days. Some people dealing with different issues. It's about getting to the bottom of these and finding out a bit more information. Um, your fertile window, so um, the womb cleanses are out about fertility as well as um, general womb healing. So depending on your needs again, it's really looking at the body and learning the body in a more specific way. Um, your cycles and hormones, so you've all heard lots about hormones today, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. But it's about having the understanding of the balance of the progesterone, the oestrogen, and etc. Charting your cycles, your ovulation, useful tools, and from puberty to menopause, like I mentioned. So this is just some of the things that my room cleanse um, goes over. We're going to a lot of things in detail, and it's a complete package. So your room space. So it's, we're dealing with the fibroids, endometriosis, polycystic ovaries, PMS. 
um, using salt baths and a clay pack. So salt baths are great at cleansing the body internally. So use it, utilizing the salt bath, Epsom salts. I prefer Himalayan sea salt, so great to have a salt bath with. So depending if you have high blood pressure, you might have to be a bit more mindful. But this is great for cleansing. Um, and energetically as well, if we're dealing with a lot of energy um, out here in the world in general, so by using salt baths is really, really helpful as well as clay packs as well. So clay packs you would put in the wound space in this area, you can use clay packs, and it helps to draw out the toxins through the skin. So we know we absorb a lot through our skin, so it's good to draw toxins out through the, um, that method as well. Unexplained infertility. So today you're hearing a lot more about hormones and we all often hear about estrogen dominance. So when we're dealing with um, estrogen dominance, it's a big thing that can explain unexplained infertility. So generally some people can go for tests and it's obvious that there's something going on and you can get support around that. But sometimes people go to tests and the doctors might say, oh, there's no issues and your hormones are fine. But sometimes even general estrogen dominance can really affect um, what's going on in the body. And sometimes there's very slight changes that need to happen particular herbs that you might need to take to create those balances in the body. So great, great womb herbs are Angus Cassis, it's a great womb herb, helping to provide us the progesterone balance in the body. Um, and Don Koi is another herb that I use in my cleanse as well, also fantastic for creating balance in the hormones within the body, dealing with balancing out that estrogen and progesterone in, in our bodies. And the biggest issue with the estrogen dominance is that um, it lets our body stay in a certain cycle for a certain amount of time. So we want the progesterone to kick in at ovulation and that will raise the temperature of the body as it's expecting to become pregnant. And if you do not become pregnant, those estrogen levels will drop again, the progesterone levels will drop and your estrogen levels will take over. So what's happening is we're having that high levels of estrogen so we're not having the cycle doing what it needs to do. So it's really important we do things to cleanse the body and to get those hormones balanced again. We can use essential oils, we can use different herbs to support that. Um, toxins that affect the body, I'm breaking out in spots, so like I mentioned, uh, we're dealing with toxins, we want to flush them from our systems to make it more effective. Stress is a big thing regarding our bodies and our cycles as well. A lot of us are working on high stress, cortisol, different things going on in the body. So we are having to find different things that we can use to support us to de-stress. So it takes some time for ourselves, to make time for ourselves. It's recommended to have a vegetarian or vegan diet where possible and always organic produce. Um, I say wild caught um, fish or an ideal world, but try your best to um, locate your local farmers markets. They are really great for um, finding really good produce if you're having problems there. Eat as much organic fruit and vegetables as possible as a part of that cleansing program. You want to do things like have things like spirulina as a superfood. Um, these are things that can really help the journey of it and support the womb space and really create that healing and balance that we need in the body. Um, as I mentioned, a vegan diet if possible. Um, and no pasteurized dairy products. So chicken that is full of hormones and um, pasteurized dairy products are full of estrogens. They pump the food with estrogens. So these are one of our key players of that estrogen dominance. You have to eradicate that from the body if we're hoping to cleanse, if we're hoping to shrink fibroids, if we're create that balance in the womb, we have to get disciplined. And it can be challenging. So that's why we say we can create the balance, we can find ways around it. White bread, white flour, we need to cut that out completely as well. So again, go for the different options. You know, there's spelt, there's kamut, um, whole wheat. And yes, you can go for whole wheat, but I'm going to try and take some of that out as well. Go for a brown rice if you can. Even better, quinoa. Go for quinoa in your diet. These are the kind of things you can mix up and make a complete difference change your diet to really create that um, good environment. So we want to be avoiding this um, beef burger belly here and are affecting us and we need to kind of make some changes. So it's not so like taking everything out that you enjoy, but if we eat that, have at least at least that 80-20 rule where we're eating more healthy options and then we can have naughty things every now and then, just not all the time, but every day. So essential oils, so I'm a wellness advocate for doTERRA and I started using these essential oils a couple of years ago. Um, and they've really changed my practice and really supported me. I've always used natural products and herbs for my children and our health, and I don't like to use pharmaceuticals if I can help it, only for emergencies when needed. 
So since I've used Otero essential oils, I've never, I haven't had to use Calpo at least in two years. I always go for essential oil first. We never really need to now because the oils are so healing. And one of the reasons I went for this particular essential oil is because I have a lot of clients and students who are trying to conceive or pregnant and they're very natural, they're therapeutic based. Um, even babies under the age of one, so generally, historically, babies under the age of one couldn't use essential oils, but with these essential oils, I can use them on newborns, as well as pregnant women as well. So that's why I love them so much, and I use them throughout for all my clients. So it has the ability to act quickly and support the entire body. So essential oils, if you put them under your feet, they'll move quickly through the limbic system um, and to every cell in your body in a very, very quick time. Within 20 minutes, it will reach your brain. So under the feet is a good place to put your essential oils or area of issue. So if you had a stomach issue, you'd rub them on your stomach, chest, neck, cold and flu, different things like that. So it's very healing as well. You use it like medicine. So essential oils take three hours to leave the body. So uh, it would every three hours if you're unwell, but you could use them daily for prevention if you needed to use it for prevention. Can be used topically. These essential oils can be taken internally, and that's sometimes an issue for people because historically you always hear essential oils are for external use only. And if you're going to a local store, Holland Barra, yes. Even uh, my mom was in Neil's yard um, a few months ago, and uh, she was asking about ginger oil. And she, my mum said, can I have this? Can I put this in my water? And the lady's like, no, you mustn't take it. And there's no way. And she's like, why? It's ginger. And she goes, no, it's not safe. Because there are all these essential oils that you can get on the market have fillers and things in that are quite dangerous for your digestive system and for your body. When you're using a therapeutic grade oil that is pure, then you can take it internally. So there are a few exceptions to the rules. So winter green, we wouldn't take internally. But we know the oils that you can't. The vast majority of the oils we use, you can take. And sometimes when we're taking them internally, they're actually a lot more effective. Um, again, you can use them topically or aromatically. So always use a cold air diffuser if you're using essential oils. Um, they have the ability to impact your mood in seconds through smell. So going right through to the limbic system in the brain. If we're feeling down, we might use a, a citrus oil, for example, and that brings up the mood and that can uplift us and it can make a big difference. Hormone balance in oils as well. So um, have some for sale today. So hormone balance in oils might be what we use clary sage for women as well. It's clary sage is a great oil for balancing out your hormones. Ylang ylang is good. Um, geranium as well is good for balancing out the hormones. I was sharing some information with some ladies earlier. There's an area just in your foot, the inside of your inside of your ankle, which is your actual wound space from a reflexology standpoint. So that's a great place to put those actual essential oils. I also use clary sage for my clients who are pregnant. Um, so we avoid clary sage till around 37 weeks of pregnancy, but it can be used to induce labor quite effectively. So we utilize the clary sage every three hours under the feet and the back until your contractures are established. Once they are, stop using it, or you'll get back-to-back -back contractions and we don't want those. So <laughs> you have to be very mindful of the clary sage. So um, we use lavender for calming as well. And um, that's really helpful. Um, and again, reducing your toxic load. So if we're using products in our hair, or our skin, like we've heard today as well, we want to reduce our toxic load because it can create space where we're imbalancing our hormones and we're causing disease. So we want to reduce from um, our bodies as much as physically possible. So um, this is a little bit more of a focused area for me today um, and when I saw these statistics I was, I would say I was more shocked but not surprised um, and when we're dealing with, I'm seeing that black women are five times more likely than our counterparts to you know, experience death during labour um, in the postnatal period and that really kind of really broke my heart. So in my work, I'm always battling and kind of against the system for women to have a more natural birth and not being forced into situations where we're getting assisted deliveries. Um, but to know that there could be something going on here, something's going on deeper in the UK that we're seeing these very significant issues going on. So why was the question? So I did a little bit more research and I know we're gonna go into this a little bit further as we go on in the day. But I started to really look at what's going on and really why and think about it. As well as the research I did around the articles that came out at the time and the videos I saw, I kind of want to get us all thinking about why we think it's happening. So can I ask how many mothers and fathers are in the room? 
bit of anxiety. Yeah, there's a lot of people here. And who in the room would say that their birth was, um, they had the birth that they wanted and it was perfect? And so I can see four or five or six people. Okay, maybe about 10 or 12. And who will say that it was quite traumatic and it was a really hard time and very difficult? So yeah, so we've seen a little bit more hands, so a little bit of balance, but you can see that if we look around the room, we're really dealing with lots of different scenarios, yeah, and there could be many reasons for this. So there, there was an argument, there's a lot more complications with um, uh, a black women regarding things like gestational diabetes or preeclampsia. And I was, that was a difficult issue for me to come about because knowing if you're having these <coughs> high risk issues, you'd be seen as a high risk patient. And when you're a high risk patient, they're looking at you more closely. They're looking after you a bit more closely. No, you can't go in the birth center. You have to go on labor ward. You'll be monitored continuously. So why is this issue still happening then? If, we're, if that is one of the reasons that we're putting out there. Yes. So we're talking about, so lady saying she, she's a midwife and wonderful to have a midwife in the system doing the works, thank you. <laughs> we need more of you. Um, but, <laughs> but it's really important that yes, six months, 12 months before you're even thinking about conceiving, you've got to get the body healthy. And that's one of the reasons I put the womb cleansers together as well. But eating different, making changes. Being, some people wait till they're having their babies to, or being pregnant before, they're thinking about getting healthy, do it before. The body is absorbing a lot. There's even information about our melanin absorbing, we're a very big absorber. You think about how we absorb the sun, if you think about where you absorbing all the foods that are poor diet relating foods, we're going to absorb that into our bodies more deeply. So we have to be very conscious of things we're eating. Thank you. That's a really important point. Are we dealing with racism in the NHS? Yes. yes. There we go. It's a big thing and we're thinking about, is it happening? So like I said, as a professional working, I've had experiences myself, which I think make the wonder maybe step back, whatever client I'm walking in the door with, whether they're a person of color or not. But I think sometimes when we're present, it's less because they know we're present. But if a woman's going in there on their own, without anybody else around that might be seen as a professional, then there might be more issues that are coming up that we're not seeing. So it's something that we have to be addressing. It's coming up in all areas of, uh, sorry, my mic keeps cutting out. <laughs> it's coming up in all areas of life regarding racism in the UK. Things are happening left and right, from football to the Royals, to everything that's going on. So it's not something that we can deny or hide. And it's something that we have to get to a bottom of, but we have to take responsibility for what's going on with ourselves. So regardless of inquiries taking place, things have to change definitely, but we have to take more responsibility for what's going on with ourselves. So is there a question? Pain threshold. Therefore, they automatically are with really hurt, really. And it's also when you're having babies, when you're going through anything, they assume that you can take it. Yeah, so that's something I had mentioned up there. Thank you as well. So, is there an assumption that we're going to be able to deal with labour more? So, then to add to that, you've got the institutionalised racism in terms of you don't have the diversity at all echelons of the NHS. We're familiar with our basic biology. Yeah, I'm, a di I'm going to talk about that a lot more as we go on. Um, so, my, as we talk about this perfect timing, is there enough awareness in the black community about further education around pregnancy, birth and beyond? Um, and is this seen or needed as an additional cost? So anybody who's with parents knows how financially straining that can be for any parent coming into having a new baby and moving onwards. And there's things that are marketed out there to us that are seen as important, like push chairs and travel systems that are a thousand pounds. 
Like, do we really need to be paying that for a share travel system? No. You might have a nice quality one, but you could get one for maybe £500. So where are we going to be investing the money that we need for things that we need? It's really important we start to invest in ourselves and invest in your pregnancies and having information around your pregnancies. It's really important to think about it. So pregnancy health. This is me when I was pregnant with my son. <laughs> Out in that, that wasn't that was the UK. It was a good summer. <laughs> um, drinking minimum of two liters of water a day. So I always recommend to my students to drink this amount of water. It's really important to keep your um, system flushed and keep really well. We're going to focus a lot on the solutions and empowering ourselves now, so that we can walk in and be advocates to ourselves when we go into labour and walk into an environment as midwives and obstetricians that we can stand up strong, knowing ourselves, and know that we can have the kind of labour we want and demand to be cared for the way we should be cared for. So we're going to start really thinking about these solutions now. Eating an extra 500 calories a day than you usually do. And I say usually because there was, there was information about 3,000 calories, but it just depends how much you usually eat. So it's about getting enough food in the system and good calories. So we're trying to eat healthier options as well. And then, you know, we don't have our cravings of pregnancy, so don't do without but make sure it's a balanced diet. It's really important. So healthy and balanced diet, good supplement range and probiotics, and I'm kind of big on probiotics as well. It's really important. Our health starts in the gut. Our gut flora is essential. So but I didn't, you can have probiotics through supplements or you can have it through food. So things like sauerkraut is a probiotic. It's good to have prebiotics as well in the body that's gonna feed the probiotics. If you're gonna have a good gut, gut flora and gut bacteria, your baby is going to pass that on to your baby. If you're planning to breastfeed and you're breastfeeding, we're also passing this on to our babies. Um, reduce your toxic load. So what are you putting on your skin? What are you using in your hair? What shampoos, what makeup? What are you putting into the body? You want to reduce the toxic load. Parabene free products, more natural products, natural toothpaste, different things, Gerodurin. It, it, the list is endless. And it's the combination of these different things, not one product that can create such a big toxic load in the body and create illness and disease. Um, rest and sleep, and I laugh a little bit about that with pregnancy because sometimes we have insomnia in pregnancy, but allowing yourself some time to rest, taking that time out, make time for yourself. Don't be rushing around 24-7. It's very difficult with the London life if you've got different work commitments, other children, it can be very, very challenging, I know, I'm always rushing around myself, I used to preach to my own choir, but it's really important to take the time to relax, if you're making that time to wind down for yourself, you can have that more of a calm environment for yourself and your body. I often tell my students who I'm teaching, or my clients, to try and get off work around 37 weeks, 36, 37 weeks pregnant, and there's always that battle with um, afterwards, like, am um, I going to have enough time after baby's born with them? So is there any leave you can take if you're um, employed, if you're self-employed, can you work around it? If the body's able to wind down before you go into labour, it needs to. If you're working on a high functioning, your body's going to not want to go to labour because it's going to think you're really busy and it's busy in itself. You need to get your body to slow down a little bit so we can get, get into a space where we can naturally go into labour. If we're kind of thinking, overthinking around work and things like that, that's going to cause a lot of issues and can slow the process down. And safe exercise as well is really important. So safe exercise, we usually say to people that it's important to um, keep doing your exercise, your normal exercise during pregnancy, and that's correct, within reason, carry on as you are, but you have to, get, you have to be very mindful at certain points, so there's certain things that you think you can do that um, you might need to calm down on, you've got to be think mindful of your joints. So you, there's a hormone called relaxing that happens as soon as you become pregnant and that softens everything in the body. Um, and so you might be more prone to injury, so it's helpful to be mindful and maybe bring your um, training down to about 50% would be a good, good area to start. So pregnancy yoga, the benefits are um, it takes um, your precious time um, to connect with you and your baby. So it's a bonding time with the baby as well in utero. I always say sing to babies, read to babies. Their brain's developing during this time as well. So all those connections in the brain, it's beautiful to have that bonding from very, very early in pregnancy. So it's really supportive to do those kind of things. A great place to meet other pregnant moms to talk to and connect with. Um, ease aches and pains and strengthen and align the body. 
reduce the fears and anxieties around birth and motherhood, and prepare the body for the baby for birth. So something we've really lost is most of us are used to sitting just like this, in chairs at work and desk. Um, a lot of people from their first pregnancies, they think, oh, lying on your back's a good way to deliver, because we see this on TV quite a lot. It's probably one of the worst positions you can be in, and anyone who's been in labor will know. You don't really want to be on your back. We want to be in positions, want to upright positions, use to realize gravity to support us. Um, different people I've done training with, um, I trained with Birthfly um, and different uh, obstetricians. Um, Michelle Don is a, a, a obstetrician who brought um, water births into France. And these people went out into different places around the world, into Africa. And I remember Michelle Don talking about um, the women that he saw in Africa didn't want to lie down. These doctors were trying to force them to lie down on beds. And they just wanted to be upright and on all fours. And, because this is how we labour naturally. We have gravity working with us, supporting us. It's helping pro um, labour to progress. You don't want to be stuck in one place. You want to have the ability to move around. And through the low yoga practice, it's a it's a body. It's a very gentle practice, but it gets women used to doing that week after week. So when you go into labour, you may even pick one or two movements that I'm teaching, but those will work for you for your labour because it's been you've been used to been doing it. You've been practicing your breathing techniques and how to breathe correctly, and how to support yourself. And all these different things are really going to be so supportive for the labour practice itself. Birth preparation workshops. So I teach in South London, um, and I teach two classes a week, a Tuesday night and a Sunday morning. But my birth preparation workshops are once a month. So once a month we do a four-hour workshop with partners together. And the reason we get partners coming in as well, as well as some of our yoga practice, is so that that dads can feel and birth partners can feel more well informed in regards to the labour process. So we're very specific during this yoga practice and during this workshop. As to allow them to feel empowered and for you to feel empowered to be advocates for each other during the labour process. And it's really important that you can be an advocate so that you can say to yourself, okay, I'm gonna, somebody suggested something or a doctor has suggested or a midwife suggested something and that might not sit right with you. So unless it's an emergency and there are sometimes emergencies where we need to just go with the flow, it happens. But generally I find sometimes there's a lot of interference and interruption, so when well, it doesn't need to be. And then this can, so this can be what we call um, intervention leading to intervention. So sometimes it's important to know certain specific things that I can be really supportive so that you can know, okay, let's have five minutes to have a conversation. I always say, have five minutes to have a conversation alone and then make a decision what the next step should be. Because sometimes it's not needed. Sometimes an induction is not needed. Often they want to induce, in, induce mums at 41 plus 5. Um, some of the reasons around that is because the placenta might not be functioning um, beyond that time. But there's lots of research to say that's not the case. Um, and I often say to mums if there's a big concern to go in every day after that point. Um, to try and avoid the induction because the induction drugs can be very um, difficult to manage that labour. Often it's often with epidural for good reason because when you're getting these hormones, oxytocin being pumped into you in a synthetic form hard and fast, it's very challenging to get through that particular indu induction without some support. And then if we're adding epidural now, we are now adding something that may slow the labour down. So it can cause uh, um, a slow progress and then we may have another need of support because it's hard to push because you're not feeling anything now so it's harder to push and we need an assisted delivery so now we might need a one two so we might need a, a forceps delivery and then it still might be challenging because that mum was able to be mobile so then it may lead to a c-section so this is why i'm saying intervention leading to intervention so if we learn certain things about our anatomy that's very natural you're creating space simply open out your feet in this position and moving in this way creates an opening in front of your pelvis to create more space for baby to come down. Simple little information, position of baby, optimal fetal position, is your baby's back at the front or side of your stomach? Because if your baby's back to back when you go into labour, this is going to make your labour very long and it can make it very challenging to progress to the next stage. You might be four hours of very strong contractions and suddenly we're still only six centimetres and we were six centimetres four hours ago. <laughs> Hi! <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, 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 w
see that progress. Um, so by getting, so as I say to moms, do not allow, lounge in the sofa after 30 weeks. So you don't want to have your hips above your knees after 30 weeks. You want to be in really upright positions or being on your side or being down on all fours. And so simple information that sometimes you don't get can really, really affect us. So these classes are prepared in, to, uh, integrated with a body-based wisdom, um, anatomically designed for you and your baby to be ready for labor. And we pull together everything you have learned in the secret stages of labor. Prepare your birth partner as well with the information so that they can feel that they can support you um, and have be advocate for you if needed during the labor process. Um, and it's a tailor-made workshop suitable for all birth scenarios and outcomes. Um, so the postnatal period. So thinking about birth experiences, um, positive birth versus traumatic birth and how we're feeling, regardless of the kind of birth experience you have, you have to kind of deal with that process yourself as well. So having that information can give you a lot more, um, you can feel a lot more empowered to support yourself through that process. Skin to skin after baby's born. So lots of skin to skin supports around breastfeeding, bonding with baby, and having that connection. Um, those who are choosing to breastfeed, making sure you get lots of support in the early weeks. Um, and I think the early weeks are really, really key around um, the neighboring mother and getting that support in the early days. I know it's challenging, I breastfed both of my children, I'm both to those two years old, but the early days were the most challenging, and that's when people tend to need the most support. And so just getting the information, getting the support you need, and even things like eating, because most moms can sometimes forget about themselves once they have a new baby to look after. So you should be eating something every three hours. So breakfast, a snack at 11, lunch, something at three o'clock, and dinner, as well as that two liters of water a day to help your milk production. Even little information like that, um, making sure babies are feeding regularly. Is there a good latch? You know, I could go on all day about what we need to be doing around that, but. It's get, getting that additional support for yourself, really important. Baby wearing as well, this is me wearing my daughter. She was teething at the time, so I could never get anything done. And it's really important just to know that we can baby wear. So culturally, we would baby wear as normal. If you look back in our history, we would keep the babies on us. And they're actually a lot more calm when we keep our babies on us. And you can actually probably safely, that breastfeeding, that connection, really important time for mother and baby for the body. If we're feeling safe and comfortable, that is the best place to be. But if we are um, feeling any fear, we will release adrenaline, and that's our fight or flight hormone. And that's gonna slow things down, and it's gonna make it a lot more painful. It's gonna start to feel changes. So it's really important for us to connect and just really have that ability to know what we need to do to create that space. Sometimes around um, going to the hospital again into today. That space, you need to be in a space where you can create that space, make your space your own, so that you can feel a lot more comfortable um, when you're there. And then we can use different things to support us if we're feeling down, we can use essential oils, we can use support from people around us as well. So classes and workshops, um, for myself, I teach on a Tuesday in Croydon, so that's south of the river, um, 7.30 till 9 on a Tuesday. Early. The birth preparation classes is a one-off workshop, so it's once a month. So even if you're a bit further afield, hopefully you can join us. Um, that's 3:30 to 7:30. So the next one um, is the 16th of February. So you're very welcome to find out for information from me about that. Um, we have a wells in the essential oil class on the 23rd of February. So if you're interested, you'd like the essential oils a bit more. That's three to four thirty. I also do online programs so if credit is a bit too far for some people. Um, you're welcome to connect to me about the online programs. Um, and uh, enjoy yoga for the um, workshops. That's where I teach most of my yoga practice. Um, to get in touch, here's some information. So you've got my email there, info at Nature's the Jetty, my Instagram and Twitter, Facebook and also uh, my email address and websites there if you need to get in touch or have any questions or further information and just for me to say a big thank you for listening oh sorry <laughs> just, just for me to say a big thank you for taking in information today um i hopefully to connect with you for the rest of the day i'll be here for the panel as well so any questions you have um does anybody have any questions just before 
Anybody have any further questions? I can get some more information. If I don't know, there's probably somewhere I can find out about it, but somebody else might have some information as well. That's something I got. So when I was invited by you to come to do it, I looked online, it was on the BBC website, and there was a research under so if you go into BBC or if you just Google it, you should find information. And I think there was further information um, on where the research was done. I think it came out last year in April 2019. So I think that's what was quite surprising for me, how recent. Information was so it was quite key. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So if you search, you'll probably find some more information about it. Yes. One more question. Playbacks. Yes. Yes, you can use a cast up, you can, you can use that um, the castor oil packs or with the clay as well. So it's the same way castor oil will also hot warm on top of that and then um then you hot water wash on top and then just allow that to stay for a certain amount of time and then you can either take that off or you can wash the clay off of this body. Wet clay and then So this is a good, really good question. It's really important to deal with things holistically, and that's why I put the um, wound cleanse program together. It's not just one. Thing. That's one thing. You can use essential oils, your um, gentle things that helps the bone out. The, the There's nothing you can do. My mum had a hysterectomy. My mum had a hysterectomy. My aunt had them removed and they grew back. My grandmother had a hysterectomy. So I was very keen to find out exactly what was going to happen and I needed to know more. Yeah. And that's why the education is so important and this is why it's important for us to teach our young people this information as well so we can get to the bottom of it earlier and quicker and prevention rather than cure. Like the young lady was saying about before you get pregnant, deal with your health earlier, before before these issues start to come up. And I was lucky to be able to not have any issues around fibroids because I was able to I was doing things from my late teens to make sure naturally that to, to try and prevent them. <laughs> thank you, thank you for sharing. Time for one more, more question here. Yeah. So if we can give the sister a big round of applause. So does anyone at the table want to answer this one? Hi, does anyone, any of the speakers have more information about adenomyosis? I was diagnosed, but not many people, even the doctors, knew much about it. Okay, so what I understand about adenomyosis is that it's when the inner lining of the uterus... Greetings. Sorry, yeah. Sorry too loud. Yeah. All right, I'm going to put it away so I don't... Is that okay? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I don't want to deafen anyone. So what I understand about adenomyosis that it's a condition where the inner lining of the uterus falls away. So it's not actually the period, it's the inner lining of the uterus. Most of the experts here would um, possibly agree with this, is that it's not always the, the, the symptoms that is important. It's 
working with you to find out what your diet's like, what your hydration's like, what your stress levels are like, what chemicals you're exposed to, what your mental and emotional state is. Because sometimes, no matter what the symptoms are, we, we'll do a consultation within 10 minutes, we might all come up with the same thing. So even though when you go out there that you put in that name and you've been given the diagnosis and nothing's coming up, so you, you can't say, okay, I've got this, so everyone says, cure it this way. Um, natural health practitioners don't always work like that. And, and when I was working as a natural, when I started training, in fact, what I was, like, was pounded into me was the opposite of the doctors. The doctors are like, find out the symptoms, then give them this. Find out the symptoms, if we need to cut it out, if we need to drug it, if we need to burn it, then that's what we're gonna do. What I was taught is, the symptoms almost don't matter as much as finding out what's going on with the person at a root cause. Because once you address someone's nutrition, once you address someone's, because some people come to me with pain and weight challenges and skin eruptions, and I almost put them to the side until I find out, okay, what are you eating? How much water are you drinking? Are you getting any raw food in at all? How many times do you pass a stool? And sometimes people can come in with like 15 different symptoms, 15 different clients, 15 different symptoms. We do the same thing to address their nutrition, their hydration, their stress, their lifestyle, and all of the conditions go. Now, if after I've worked with someone for four or five weeks or six or seven weeks, and the symptoms are still not going, then we start addressing the symptoms. But the, the foundation is most important. Because you can have the prettiest house with the nicest curtains and the designer door and the laminate carpet and, and you know shag pile and all that kind of stuff. But if the foundation's rocky, you're going to keep on getting cracks in the walls. Yeah. You're going to keep on getting subsidence. And that's the most important thing is to work on the foundation. And ancestrally, our ancestors worked on the foundation from birth. Once a couple started courting, the man was put on a diet, the woman was put on a diet. Once they got married, they were, their diets were adjusted because it wasn't like, oh, would we have a child? It's they're gonna have a child. It was just second nature, they're gonna have a child. And then when the mother got pregnant, she was put on another diet. And then when she was in the fourth stage of pregnancy, the fourth trimester after the baby's born, she was put on another diet. So we were always considerate of prevention. Our lifestyle was preventative, as opposed to, oh, wait until the symptom comes up, let's do something about it. So. And it is unfortunate that when you put in things like adenomyosis, even when you put in metrorrhagia, the condition that I have, you put in a lot of conditions, not much comes up. And it's unfortunate that our conditions are so blase, oh, it's just a black woman's problem. Keisha, don't worry about it, it's just a black woman's problem. Five boys are, oh, you've learn to deal with it like you've learned to deal with everything else. You're black women, innit? Yeah. You know how to deal with pain, just get on with it. That's literally the mindset. You're Serena Williams, you're an Olympic star, just get on with it. You've, you, 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 you've probably had injuries before, just get, you're Beyonce, you're the richest woman in the world. Just get on with it. No, we're black women, like, and, and that's, that's why these events are so important, because we're not following the model of the medical establishment that was not designed for us. And we have to take our health into our own hands. And I would highly encourage everyone to not focus on getting rid of their symptoms as much as finding out what's causing those symptoms in the first place and addressing it from there. Because what's gonna happen remarkably is when you start addressing your foundation, every, every other problem you've lived with is gonna start disappearing. You're like, well, I've always had this pain when I woke up, and I just woke up just like that. I always wake up with sleep in my eye. It's not there anymore. My husband always used to snore. He don't snore. This must be a miracle. Literally, stuff you weren't even thinking about is going to start rectifying itself. Because again, your body is designed to heal, grow, and repair itself. It just needs the energy to do that. And even if your condition doesn't have a name, holistic health is going to manage it. Standards. Okay, so we don't have any other questions through the live stream. So does anyone else have any other questions, greetings, for any of the other experts? Well, so, sorry, for the sake of the recording, we're gonna, yeah, ah, you're gonna, yeah. Okay, so but for the sake of the recording, we're gonna get people to take the mic round. So uh, please wait until the mic comes to you before you start speaking. Thank you very much. Okay, so first of all, um, I had fibroids removed about 22 years ago. Surprise, surprise, they've come back. And they're worse than before. You know, I said to a consultant I saw in the hospital, um, I've got the size of um, a six month pregnancy. She looked at me like I was an idiot. And then when she pushed around and poked around because she couldn't find the scans, oh yes, they're the size of a six month pregnancy. Oh, that's a surprise. So I've been pregnant, I know what it looks like. But what I find quite interesting is, does anybody on the panel yourself, Leah, 
has any black doctor, female or male, done any work on this? I won't be surprised if you say that you don't know or you all know because the black woman's condition, like you said, get on with it. And secondly, has anybody from a holistic health point of view done any work on fibroids? Because it's so common. Thank you, sis, for that, that um, question. Thinking about any research that's been done, I don't know of any black doctors have done any research thinking about it. Something I'd like to look into more. As you said, that I'm keen to go and have a look at it myself now to find out a bit more information if there is something out there. But you're right, it's something that needs to be addressed. And just keep giving the blanket, oh, take contraceptive pills, do this, do that, to get rid of it is not our solution. And the holistic, like Leah said, the holistic element of it is really key. And that's the foundation of the claims and stuff that I do with my clients is deal with your health and your healing first. It's so, so key. And that is the important thing for us to get to. But yes, we do need some more research. It is essential. But I would like to look into that actually because I haven't, personally, I haven't heard it. I don't know if anybody else has heard of anything that's specific. Um, it's not... It's not necessarily related to fibroids per se, but um, I did come across something and it was, I was led to it by a lady in America you might have heard of her called Chef Aki, um, who has a fibroids elimination plan. And she um, did an interview and she was talking about um, a scientific paper, then I went and looked at it, around high levels of estrogen exposure and how that leads to growth of tumours. So we know, or we are, we are aware that black, young black girls tend to start their periods earlier, and that can be a mixture of um, diet, the kind of things we're eating, um, skin and hair care products as well. But the longer, what I saw in the paper and what they were saying was that the longer that you are exposed to estrogen, so this is natural estrogen occurring in your body, the longer that you're exposed to those things, the more likely you are to have uh, cell growth and abnormal cell growth. Um, so that could be an explanation for the prevalence of fibroids. I haven't looked into it enough, but that was something that was I picked up on and thought I need to look at that a little bit more. So I throw a challenge to you to collaborate and do the work, because it's only yeah. you. Yeah. I'm 62 this year, and I'm a bit of eight years old. So, you know, we need, if we're going to chart down the alternative system, then we need to do the work, yeah. would. Thank you. Okay, what I will say is that I stopped using doctors as a benchmark a long time ago. So when I'm looking for solutions, I don't look for doctors. I don't think, oh, have the medical professionals done research on it? And if they haven't, then there's none. Because if you do Charmaine's program, you're likely to get better results than if you were to work with, if you did Charmaine's program in conjunction with working with Claudine, in conjunction with the personal development of Abby, you will probably get better results than going to the doctors because these sisters have created something holistically from, from their experience and from their knowledge. So even though you may not be able to find it in the medical professional, that's not the only um, place that you can go to because I know and work, have researched and know clients who have gone through other people's women elim elimination programs and it's been more successful than when they did go to the doctors. So that's part of the challenge today. I know that, that's what I'm saying. It's challenge accepted because she got it. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. The sisters got a, a womb cleanse program. Yeah. There's even two brothers in America from who were born the in. UK, yeah. Huh? yeah, they were from the UK. And now they're in America, um, and they have a womb cleanse program that they do with a sister called Coach Jesse. I mean, what I'm saying is it's already out there. I wouldn't. I highly recommend that you don't stop at there's no medical research and the doctors don't know as that's the only answer because they just don't know. Like it's, I've spoken to junior doctors because I thought it was a myth when they said that doctors don't have nutritional training. I spoke to a junior doctor who was about to qualify. I said, how much tra training have you had in nutrition? She said, oh, about a week. Seven days. Yeah, seven days. And I said, what did you learn? She goes, oh, just tell them to give, give them some vitamins. That's it. And for older people, what do you think they give all older people? Ensure. That is their nutritional training. Give older people nutriment, nourishment. Remember nourishment? Banana nourishment, chocolate nourishment. I used to live on that. If I miss the lunch, it's nourishment in it and I'm good. Nourishment and supermart and I'm good. That is the nutritional training that they use. To, that, that's what doctors have. And, and, most of, and we know your body is made of nutrients. So there's no disease that's caused by a lack of medication. You don't have cholesterol because you're not taking statins. 
You don't have high blood pressure because you're not taking beta blockers. That's not the reason you've got those problems. So taking those problems is just so you don't have, you're not, like period pains aren't caused by the lack of the pill. There's a reason for them. And all doctors are able to, I call them symptom managers. Doctors are symptom managers. They're brilliant at managing symptoms. And they're, they're so good at managing symptoms, they create new symptoms. They'll give you something to get rid of a symptom. That, that something causes two more symptoms. Oh, we can deal with that too. Then that creates three more. Oh, we got something for that. They, they, they reproduce symptoms. They're so good at treating symptoms and creating more symptoms. So challenge accepted. The sisters, it's already out there. It's already out there. Hi, I just wanted to thank each one of you ladies for amazing presentations. My question is directed to Claudine. You've mentioned something about three types of estrogen. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry, what's the question? Can you elaborate? Elaborate on that. Oh, elaborate right, on the... sorry. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, your body naturally produces estrogen anyway, and then it goes. It needs to go through various processes to take action that it needs to take. Um, so it's converted. Um, you start off. Oh, I can't remember the name. I can't remember the exact names now, but it's um, estrol and uh, uh, yeah. Um, I can't remember the exact names, but yeah, that's it. And um, so yeah, it's converted three times to be able to do the job that it needs to do, and then. The final one is the one that is most active. So it's it's gone through the process um, in terms of doing having the effect on your reproductive system. Uh, the final one is the most active, and what would normally happen is that it would be converted by the liver into a safe form so that it can be secreted out. But if that hangs about in your system for too long, because it's highly active, it can have an effect on your cells, and that's where we start to see um, cellular growth uh, or abnormal cellular growth as well. The other thing to note about the estrogen is, like the sister said, when it hangs around the system, it can cause problems. And that's why a lot of us have spoken about digestive wellness, and especially things like supporting your liver, because your liver makes sure that there's not excess estrogen and hormones floating around your body. But when your liver is congested, and I can see in your blood when your liver's congested, it can't do that job. It can't do the job of getting rid of excess hormones. So those excess hormones just start keep floating around your body, and then they'll find places to settle and eat on and make use of the, the, the healthy tissue in your body. So it's really important that you do focus on making sure you're cleansing, you're cleansing your liver and supporting your liver. So celery juice, first thing in the morning, is very restorative to your liver. The herb milk thistle is very restorative to your liver. And these will get rid of the congestion, because literally in your blood, I can see half broken blood cells that are floating around. And your blood goes through your liver every, the, all of the blood in your body goes through your liver every 20 minutes roughly, depending on your size and height. And your liver should be pulling those out of circulation. And when we can see a lot of old dead blood cells in your circulation, we can tell your liver, as well as a lot of other things, we can tell your liver's congested. And it's no surprise that you've got estrogen dominance. Because again, your body in its natural state would have been able to cycle that off and then you would eliminate it through your urine or your stools. Yeah, just to add what, to what he is saying, if we're thinking about processed food as well, if we're eating a banana, it, your body will recognise potassium and it'll yeah. go through the process. If we're dealing with processed food, the body's thinking, what, what is this? Mm -hmm. And then we're getting the store build up as well. So this is why I have to be very mindful about that processed food as well. So just to kind of add yeah. in. Okay, we're going to have time for one more question, then we're going to go for a break. Okay, how many questions do we have? <laughs> no one had their hand up until I said that. <laughs> okay, one, two, three. <laughs> We've got, we've got three questions over here. Okay, sis, it's, you, it's all on you. It's all on you, sis. I'm not taking the fall. The sister in the middle is going to choose who gets the questions. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about cosmetic surgery and just this trend I'm finding with some of our younger sisters who I think that they want to change their body shape. And I feel that there's not been much discussion in our community about the implications, you know, the side effects. It's just seeing people on Instagram with, you know, these big breasts or, you know, changing their bottom or their shape. And we're not really looking at what this is doing to us and what it's reflecting in terms of our self-esteem. You're trying to say I can't get a boob job. <laughs> is that what she's saying? Like, I can't get a boob job. Because I have the money down and everything. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, 
I think a lot of our young people are, everything is exposed. Everything is snapped in a minute. And that's the life and that's the story that they're looking and they're thinking that they want to live. And I think when the, they're kind of growing up in this culture of seeing all these programs, even my daughter's 21 and they watch this program called Botched, like where all these really dodgy surgeries have taken place and you know people are really, really disfigured. Um, but it, it's almost like I feel like in their world, that is their reality. And I think my concern is that because it's a warped reality, it's not a real reality, you're aspiring to be something that you're actually not. If you're not able to keep up with that trend, or if you felt that you're left behind, okay, then I think for a lot of young women particularly, that definitely causes them short, medium or long-term mental health issues. Because they are so, so concerned with their own image and not being good enough and not wanting to look at in the mirror and not wanting to see their reflection, they want to see somebody else's reflection. So I think it's kind of down to all of us, women in the room, to, to let them know whenever you can, whether it's your daughter, mother, sister, friend, you are beautiful. You are beautiful as you are. You will always be beautiful and you stand in your own magnificence every day, every day. I just said, I think she's absolutely right. Um, Abby's right. Um, I've got a 14 year old daughter, and I monitor on Snapchat, I monitor on Instagram because she thinks that being a curvy girl is the norm. So she saw the girls from um, TLC, she said, Oh my god, they're so skinny. Um, there's, there's, there's no curves there. I said, Well, it's, just, it's a normal body, heaven. Not everyone has curves, it's normal in our time. She to have a slim body and a slim waist, and no bust is okay. But she thinks that everyone has a big bus and the big boobs and that's the norm for them at this phase. So I think, again, it's communication to your child and letting them know that she's okay to be flat chested, have a flat bum, it's okay, it's normal. No one has to be a, a Kim Kardashian. That's, you know, it's, it's, it's a trendy thing. It's not a normal thing. So, um, yeah, I think it's communication in the home and letting your child know they're okay how they are. And just, I keep speaking to them. Keep on speaking to them. Just quickly, everybody. Kim Kardashian, yeah? Hello? I know the I know the space. It's, it's, it is, yes. It's us though, isn't it? It's I us and it's so... I know, I know, but I just had to add that in. Because, uh, <laughs> That's what's in their world. Okay, we've got about five more minutes. So if we can get the other three questions, please. Hiya. Hello, is that okay? Yes, so perfect. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. Just really to say to the panel, to you all there, thank you very much. And I think on behalf of everybody, for you creating and presenting the Hidden Science Academy. Because it's been hidden because not a lot of, a lot of people have been talking about this. Quite simply, I'm sitting here and I'm hearing a lot of other ladies that are talking about my sister here, fibroids, I think I've got exactly the same, I've got literally a girlfriend right behind me, went to the same school, more or less the same thing, the fibroids, I'm sorry, I am going back to this, we are beautiful, we're beautiful, think about the Imans, think about the Jordans and all the others, forget Kim, let's just think about that. <laughs> right, and what I'm trying to say is that at the end of the day, listen, ladies, wake up, the people in front of you, the panel, the people in all these shops, Everyone is working for you. Look at their faces. They are you. Reflection of you. Don't look at this. Um, don't look at the medical side. Don't look at your um, doctors. I was blessed because I had a doctor that was a black doctor, so he was looking out for me. He protected me. What I'm trying to say is, a lot of the time, what they're trying to do is make sure that we have a mastectomy. Not mastectomy. Make sure that they take away the hysterectomy. Make sure they take away the boob. Think about what it is. It is. Like, it's almost like a, a. It's a conspiracy. Thank you. The word. It's a conspiracy. Be careful. Think about the things that we've been using in our hair and so on. It is time. Wake up, everybody. Wake up. Yeah. Enjoy what you've been seeing today and listening to today. Thank you. Okay. Two more questions because we've got three minutes. If you don't get your question answered, I've just decided that the sisters are going to sit there 
<laughs> and you don't just come to the table because we're going to go for a break. But the sisters are going to, I'm not even going to let them get up. So if you don't get your question answered here, then they're going to be barricaded here so you can just come to the table and ask some questions. <laughs> All right, hello. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Greetings. All right, my name is Ren. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for all of this. Um, can you, can somebody on the panel or someone in the room talk a little bit about the, or the, the high level of autoimmune conditions that are happening, um, particularly, it's, according to my wide spectrum of friends, it feels like uh, it's predominantly people of my high, you know, wonderful melanated people, and also, how the genome project relates to all of this. There's a he human genome project, which if you could shed some light on why that project is the reason why we should not be always relying on what the doctor says, because actually they, they do not know, they do not have all of the statistics and all the information on us because we are not part of the human genome project. But yeah, more importantly, can we talk a bit more about the autoimmune conditions, please? Because it's just out of control. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Um, so I dealt with auto an autoimmune condition myself um, when I was at university, and that's what really triggered my own health journey. Um, so mine wasn't even really diagnosed or given a name. Luckily, I was able to go to private healthcare, and it took about. I'd say over 12 months, maybe about a year and a half for things to get back to normal. And even now I still have to pay attention to certain things. Um, and yes, yeah, speaking to other, I guess I was, what, about 19 when it happened. So feeling really isolated. I didn't know anybody else who had been going through anything like that. And then years later speaking to other people and finding out there are so many other black people that are deep that have dealt with things like that. And they've gone through a lot worse experience than I did because they went through the NHS and it took a lot longer and the condition got worse. Um, so yeah, it's, it's sad, and um, it's not, I mean, I may be focused on women's health, but I have looked into it somewhat, and I, I believe that some of it, well, there has been evidence, actually, I think there's been studies to show that some autoimmune conditions can be linked to trauma as well, particularly maybe in childhood, so, um, you know, uh, I guess, your body will respond to trauma in the same way that it would respond yeah. to an, an illness. You know, it's, it's something, if it's a men, I'm talking about an emotional trauma or something like that. Um, so it's something that can still cause um, inflammation and imbalance in the body. Um, and there has been studies to show that possibly childhood, uh, what do they call it, childhood you know, ace, aces, childhood um, adverse conditions, something like that. Um, can there is a link between that and autoimmune conditions? Um, and I think that I think that there could be a possible a possible link there. I mean, since you sound like you su you have quite a bit of knowledge about it already, but um, the room anything from vaccinations to dairy to the antibiotics that they're pumping into their animals, all of those things will make your auto make your healthy immune system start treating your your healthy cells as dangers and start attacking them. So in the same way, inflammation is good. Inflammation is what happens when your body re recognizes something's wrong. It creates inflammation, but it should only be for a short amount of time, then it reduces. And inflammation becomes dangerous when there's an imbalance and it stays and it's prolonged. The same thing with the contractions of your womb when you're having your period. Small contractions, fine, to release the lining. When things stimulate it to unhealthy levels, it contracts too much and it's pushing like you're having a baby. And it's the same with your immune system. Your immune system's there to defend you. But when your immune system has to deal with the gases from the fumes, from the cars, and radiated food, and then uh, GMO foods, and then things in the air, chemtrails, and the junk in the water, and the EMF from your phone that you're on all the time, and then the tablet, and then the TV, your immune system goes crazy. It doesn't know what to, it doesn't, it doesn't now know what to recognize as healthy and unhealthy. And some of these foods that we're taking in start literally making our healthy cells unhealthy or unrecognizable to your immune system, and your immune system just wants to attack everything constantly. So there are so many, it's, it's just a product of living in an unnatural world. It's, 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 and not to say that we need to become one of those people that's like lives in a pyramid made of amethyst. Like we don't need to go that far and walk around with a pyramid on our heads 
with sage, like white sage and everyone, don't come near me. That, we're really still all of that. But we need to be mindful that we can use ancient wisdom as well as modern technology to survive in the environment. Because humans are very adaptable. We're very adaptable. I mean, we're so adaptable. They've predicted that in the next 10 or 20 years, children are going to be born with bigger thumbs. To, because we use our thumbs so much, we're going to be born with smaller noses so that we're not taking in as much um, um, pollution and our eye, the pupils of our eyes are going to be changed as well because we're looking at screens so much. There's, uh, adaptation will happen and it is part of living in this society but we, you can live in the world but not of the world. That's a famous saying of my spiritual guide, Dr. Malachi Zio, you can live in the world but not of the world. You don't need to do what everyone else is doing to survive in this world. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of time, so can we give a big round of applause to Claudia Cornhill, Abby Oshu, Sal Baxter, and Charmaine Hickett. They will be here for you to come and ask questions too. And we're going to go for a break. We're going to be coming back at 5.45 for the last part of the evening. Again, you can make your orders for your food demonstration and get your tickets through this way and then go and sample the demonstration in the other direction. Stall, two stall rooms down there, two stall rooms up there, and we will see you again in one hour. Thank you. Hope you're enjoying the live stream so far. We're on a break now, but stay tuned. We'll be back soon.